Now, I want to share an uplifting message with you tonight about women in the Messianic Age. But I'd like to tell you a funny story first. And it's a story about a woman. I worked with a woman named Betty at one time, and she was five foot four, redhead, and she weighed 85 pounds. And Betty was a very close friend with another woman in our office, and both of them had always wanted to visit the Caribbean. Now, neither Betty nor Gloria were married, so it seemed fitting that they could travel together. So they saved their lunch money. I don't know how long they saved it, but they saved their money. They joined a tour. They bought new luggage. They planned their wardrobe. And they flew out of Austin on the trip of a lifetime. Now, Betty did not weigh very much, and unfortunately, she took a very heavy bag for a one-week tour in the Caribbean. I lead tour groups to Israel, and I've seen people take all kinds of luggage on trips of a lifetime. Some, you know, no matter what I say, I always say, Take less than you need, pack in as small a bag as possible, and uh, just pack very, you know, don't take very much. So, but no matter what I say, some people bring furniture-sized <laughs> objects to Israel, and, uh, and that doesn't work very well. Unfortunately, Betty did something like that, and... Uh, and uh, she packed her bag too full, and when they landed in the Caribbean, she was tired. She was standing beside the luggage carousel, and she was exhausted because she'd stayed up late the night before, and I um, don't think that was supposed to go off. Oh, well. Ben will fix it. She'd stayed up too late the night before from sheer excitement, so Betty was exhausted, and she was standing beside the luggage carousel waiting for her luggage to come around, and it did. And she went over there, and she grabbed the handle of her luggage, and she pulled, but she couldn't get it, and she wouldn't let go of the handle. <laughs> and that moving luggage pulled her right up onto the carousel. And she was sitting up there among the luggage. <laughs> this is a true story. And uh, what, would, what could she do? Should she roll off? Should she crawl off? There was nothing she could do. This trip they had planned for for so long. And so she was moving along at a steady pace <laughs> up on the luggage carousel and starting to go around the corner. And uh, a, there was a, a Texan in the group that tour left from Austin, and so there was a strong Texan in a big hat who went over there, and he said, I'll help you, ma'am. And he reached out, and he put his hands around Betty, and he picked her up, and he set her out on the floor. Then he reached over and got that bag that she couldn't lift and put it down beside her. And that was so funny. We got a big laugh at the office when they got back from their vacation. But, you know, as women, we think that men are useful for things like that. They have more upper body strength, and they are useful for picking women up off of moved, moving luggage carousels whenever the need arises. <laughs> and so, uh, bless her heart, she didn't weigh very much. Now, in our minds, uh, that's the idea we have that men are there to protect us. They're there to help us. They're physically stronger than we are. And so this is how we think about men. And in our memory, women have always been encircled by men because they require protection. Godly men marry fully understanding that they're going to defend and protect a weaker woman, a defenseless woman. And so this is the idea we have. And males are committed to shielding females for a number of reasons, but one of which is war. And so they have the idea they're going to defend women and children in times of war. 
But in the coming Messianic age, there is no war. Isaiah 2.4 states, And he shall judge between the nations, and shall decide for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. So Isaiah 2.4 describes a future age when weapons are obsolete. Weapons will be converted to tools for tending vineyards and crops. Women and children will not require protection. According to this verse, women will not rely on security because there is no threat. The book of Isaiah says that even a little child will guide and direct ferocious animals. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 says, And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the seas. Now, if a child is able to reach his hand into a viper's nest and not be harmed in the coming age of the Messiah, What feats will women accomplish? What will be her role if she doesn't require protection from war? I believe women in the Messianic age will be more like Hava in the Garden of Eden. Hava did not need to be defended in the garden. She really didn't. There was no threat there. But she could have defended herself if there had been a threat because she was strong Now, Jeremiah identifies the role of women in the coming Messianic age, and it looks very much like the role of Hava in the garden. Jeremiah 31, 22 says, God has created what is new on the earth. A woman shall encompass a man. Now, Jeremiah 31 is an entire chapter of restoration. So we have to take this verse in the context of restoration. But what's being restored here? When Jeremiah says that a woman will encompass or surround a man, he's speaking of a future time when all things are restored. In the future, a woman will encompass a man. Now, today we see a picture of this in the Jewish wedding ceremony because when the bride arrives at the hoopah, she surrounds, she encircles her husband seven times under the hoopah. And it's a picture of a woman encompassing a man. She walks around seven times. She is encompassing him and encircling him. Now, she encircles him like the walls of Jerusalem encircled the temple. And this explains why the bride in very early wedding ceremonies, Jewish wedding ceremonies, wore a golden crown of Jerusalem on her head. It was a picture of circling her husband as the walls of Jerusalem circled the temple. And so we, we see just a little bit of picture of this. Now, Jeremiah used a word, he uses a word in this verse, hadash. And hadash, as you know, doesn't mean new. It's translated as new thing. But what does hadash mean? It means renewed, restored, renovated, or rebuilt. So it's not talking about something brand new. It's talking about restoration. And restoration circles back to the beginning of a circle. You know, we see that in the, in the Hebrew new moon. The, the moon is not new because the old moon died. The moon is new because time has returned to the beginning of the moon. 
And so that's what we're talking about here. This is what Jeremiah is talking about. So his new thing is not an entirely new novel arrangement. Hadash is restoration, like restoration of the temple or revitalizing of one's spirit or the rebuilding of a city. And so he really piques my interest here. What is he saying? I believe that Jeremiah is saying that he's that things are restored to what they were before. If you're restoring something, you're going back to the beginning of the circle. So he's restoring, he's talking about the role of women being restored to what it was at the beginning in the garden. You know, we really want to understand Hava in the garden. Her name appears only twice in scripture, but how many books have been written about this first lady? Clearly, we don't understand everything that she did or how she behaved there. But Jeremiah takes us right back to the very first pages of Genesis. The most successful relationship between a man and a woman is found in the very first pages of Scripture. Now, the typical word for woman is isha. Now, the, this word is not the word Jeremiah uses in Jeremiah 31, 22. He doesn't use that word. He uses the word nekevah. And nekevah points to a boundary. The nekevah sets boundaries and encompasses a man with the perimeters of a wall. The nekevah also means to turn back, to change, and to turn around. So this word has great meaning, and that's the word Jeremiah is using in that verse. The women in Jeremiah's prophecy turns around to the beginning of God's original design for women. In the Messianic age, a woman returns to what God originally intended women to be. So we have to know what that is. She becomes an instrument as well for returning men to God's original design. Women fill an incredibly valuable role in returning to the original Genesis design. Now, what was the Genesis design? What did she do there? You know, we always hear about the big, you know, sin, but she did a lot more than that. We know what he did because Scripture tells us what he did. He stood in the middle of the garden, surrounded by exquisite beauty. He ate succulent fruit, he enjoyed sparkling water, green pastures, and striking animals of every kind of species. It was all there for him to enjoy, and he was the master of everything. So he had a wonderful time standing there in the grandeur of creation. He took it all in. Then, on a, then God brought the animals to him for him to name. And as Adam saw the creatures and named them, he saw partners, male and female together. Because when the animals sprang up, they sprang up male and female. And then he knew he did not have a partner. He was alone. And he realized that none of those creatures were suitable partners or companions for him. Not a suitable helper among the animals. And so he had this deep and unfulfilled lack because God had fashioned him as a lone being without a mate. A powerful feeling of isolation permeated Adam. He was missing something so essential and so integral to his happiness, and to his sense of completion. God had created him as a social creature, and he enjoyed conversing with God, but he wanted to converse with an equal. God was not his equal. God was far above him. He wanted to converse with a mate. And God described what Adam was feeling when he said it was not good for him to be alone. What was man so lacking that it was not good?
before she was created? What part would she play in his life that would make her so essential to his mission? This is what we need to know. Without a helper, he was not complete, but he wanted someone to share his mission with. Adam was painfully alone before God fashioned Hava. And maybe God decided that I'm going to allow you to feel this loneliness so that you will treasure her that much more. When, she, when I do bring her, she will be a treasure to you because you'll remember what it was like to be alone. And you will treasure her for the treasure that she is. The lesson of his loneliness was that he was going to be grateful for receiving a partner and a helper. He would appreciate her and value her. So when God made Hava, and I think I went past that slide, when God made Hava, thank you, Ben, that's awesome. Her name means living one and source of life. Her name is related to the word Haya, which means life or to live, because she was the mother of all the living. How many books have been written about this lady? Again, her name appears only twice in Scripture. So even though Adam walked in the garden, the precise human relationship that he needed, she had. She brought that to him. She was a shelter for him and a place of refuge. You know, we hear that women create the sanctuary of the home. She did too. That's what she was called to do. She could build a wall around him to protect him. God made her perfectly equal with Adam. She was not created inferior nor superior. She was his equal in every way. And so she was his perfect balance, perfect counterpart, and perfect counterbalance. When God created that relationship... Equality, harmony, and righteousness between Adam and Hava was his intent. That's what he wanted. When they first met, Hava awoke from a deep sleep. She looked into his searching eyes, and I believe she instantly knew that she was part of him. That they were two parts of one song, a song that could not be completed unless they sang it together. And so she knew instinctively who he was and that she was part of him. It, the, she was an actual part of his being, an integral part of his life. She was a component of him. Therefore, she was the one best equipped to complete him. In the very first moments of creation, God reminded man and woman, of the essential tools that each one of them had. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there that day? Essentially, we were there, in a matter of speaking, because we were in the loins of Adam. But to hear God introducing the two of them, wouldn't that have been awesome to hear? in those very first moments. By design, each one of them had a unique set of skills that the other one needed. And so to the man, God said, look at your first moments before she entered the world. You had the entire world at your fingertips, and it wasn't enough. You were lacking. Not only were you lacking, your life was not good. Adam, remember your feelings of utter loneliness. Without her, your life was incomplete. Treat her with the respect she deserves, remind her of how much she means to you. Make her the center of your world. Value your, her relationship more than anything and make her feel like the treasure she is. And to the woman, God said, you are his greatest helper without whom he simply cannot succeed. Your smile, your approval, your words of praise, your words of encouragement 
are like oxygen to him. They pump life into his veins. You hold the building blocks of what is essential to his life. He needs you to build him up. He seeks your approval. And so Hava inspired in him the confidence he needed to achieve God's objectives. He needed her to help him accomplish his mission. Each one of them had what the other one needed. And we really have to get a handle on this to understand what this woman is in the Messianic age. To see a picture of their partnership and the trust that they had for one another, we need to look at Proverbs 31, 11. This is the woman of valor hymn. Proverbs 31, 11 says, The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. Now, this verse uses a very critical word for trust, the word batak. This is a word that is never used in any other human relationship. It is almost always used exclusively for a person's trust in God. But here it's being used in the context of marriage. This verse says that a man trusts his wife like people trust God. Not as an authority figure, but as a strong and suitable helper. In Scripture, the expression suitable helper most often describes God's relationship to Israel. He's a suitable helper because he's stronger. She's a suitable helper because in some ways she's stronger. In some ways she is. She can build a wall around him that he can't build around himself. Psalm 3320 explains, he is our help and our shield. And that word for help there is azir, the same word God uses to describe Hava in the garden. She is a help and a shield for him. This is the quality of the wife in the Garden of Eden. She's the strong, protective, and courageous helper for him. She was strong like a wall. She encompassed him like a wall. Now, with this comparison in mind, we see that Adam trusted her, and why not? Why wouldn't he trust her? She offered him the kind of protection he could find in no other creature. She was designed specifically to meet his need for protection. Now, we don't think about that very often, but she was his wall. Now, Genesis 2.21 says that the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Rib is the word selah, and selah does not convey the idea of a rib in the biblical language. The word actually refers to side, the whole side, or the side walls, or the side rooms, or side chambers around the temple. You know, the second temple was built with the the side chambers around the temple, and they helped to fortify the structure. Well, they were also useful, but it's the same word for rib. So it's like she was not a rib, but she was his side chamber. she She was the side rooms around his temple. When God took her out, it's as if she had been there all along and he just pulled her out. Woman represents the household in which a man can live in peace. We women have the ability to create that kind of sanctuary in our home. And she did that for him. That's who she was made to be. And that's what a woman of valor does. She creates a sanctuary of peace in the home and she watches over the man. She is a protective wall for him. God endowed her with understanding so that she instinctively knew what to do. When she met him, she had a special purpose and a God-given mission as part of the original code in the garden. 
She strengthened, protected, and encompassed him. A woman encompasses a man. And deep inside, every woman instinctively remembers what she was made to do. We instinctively know that this is what we do. We're the supporting wall. So the best way for the serpent to injure the first couple was to knock a hole in the supporting wall. He, he didn't have to get to Adam. He had to get to her because she was the wall. She protected the home, the sanctuary of their home. She encircled him. So if he could get to her, he could destroy him. Now, the tragedy of listening to the serpent was that Hava failed in her role of protecting him. Her purpose as a wall to enclose, protect, and set boundaries was destroyed. And suddenly, she was disqualified from the, her role as a type of protector. He was now required to protect her. God had to reverse their roles. So her role as Nazir, a strong helper, what God is to Israel, was reversed. Sin reversed that. She sinned and God had to deal with that. So the perfect bond was broken. The hierarchy between them was rearranged. And suddenly, he had to protect her. He, that's how God responded to her sin. He reversed the roles. Sin creates consequences. Sin can turn things upside down and throw the entire world out of order. That's what sin does. And it did that in the garden. It affected the order in the garden, the divine order that God intended. Now, in the Messianic age, a woman returns to the original order. She re Hadash is restore, return, go back to the beginning. And so Jeremiah 31, 22 says, God has created what is new on the earth. A woman encompasses a man. This verse paints in bold strokes the fact that a woman will encompass a man in the future. And that word for man is not the, it's not ish, it's uh, gever, I think. Mighty man. He's a mighty man. That's a warrior. How is a woman going to encompass him? How does she do that? You know, when we think that woman will return to the original role of Hava in the garden and be more of a protector, more, uh, more of a surrounding wall or a boundary setter around a man, we may think that, that there's going to be a reversal of roles. Maybe she's going to wear men's clothes or she's going to think like a man. You know, some, uh, some Bible translations play that up and they say, they translate that verse to say, a woman shall court a man or a woman shall woo a man. And that's not at all what it says in the Hebrew. She's going to encompass him because she's strong. Ladies, we're much, much stronger than we think. You know deep inside that you have the ability to protect your home. And we can't be afraid to exercise that strength. There's not going to be a reversal of roles. Women are not going to wear men's clothes because that would violate the Torah. So that can't be true. Also, interpreting Jeremiah 31, 22 as a reversal of roles is very dangerously misleading because it leads people to think that the, that, uh, the social platforms that promote Women, equality for women, equal rights, and all of that, that that actually is going to come to pass because of Jeremiah's prophecy. That's not at all what the prophet intended. A woman encompasses a man because she is the surrounding wall. She's the walls around Jerusalem, the walls that encircled the temple. She's his side rooms, the side chambers around his temple. You know, restoration doesn't mean the death of the old and the birth of something brand new. It is the renewal of, of a role that already exists. Women will return to being the Selah, the bearing walls. 
They will encompass their men and help them to be strong and fulfill God's call on their lives. He has a mission, so does she. In the coming age of restoration, God restores the original code for women. He restores woman's original role as part of the restoration of all things. She's restored to her original role because all things are restored. Jeremiah 31 is a chapter of restoration. A woman will again be a wall around her man. She will build him up. She will fortify him. And as she fortifies him, she strengthens herself. The woman in her restored original position is the, is the man's shelter, his tabernacle, and his sanctuary. And that's really going to come to the forefront in the Messianic age. Jeremiah's prophecy points to the genuine design. It's not a new thing. It's a renewed thing. A man will no longer encompass a woman. He will be encircled and encompassed by his wife. A woman encompasses a man because she is transformed to be what Hava was created to be, an Azir, a suitable helper, and a protector, the protective walls. She will once again be like a rescuer, a spiritual director, someone who keeps her husband's face turned toward God. She will be a spiritual director and influence in the home. Now, God has not abandoned his original model in spite of the fact that the original model is turned upside down. God hasn't forgotten how he created her. We will see it come to pass with our own eyes. In the Messianic age, God restores each woman and man to the original design. And I, it's so late, I am going to stop there because it's very, very late. and We've gone over tonight. But I want us to think as we think about that age to come, the age when there is no war, we're not going to need protection. We're going to be able to become what he's made woman to be, what Hava really was made to be, the Azir. A, not just a suitable helper, but someone who's strong. We'll be strong. We won't be able to tell ourselves, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, the, I'm weaker. I'm the weaker gender. That's not going to work in the Messianic age. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you.